Hello. I'm Martin Rawlings Pine. Uh, I've been a member of the synagogue for over 20 years. Uh, I'm a Jewish, bisexual, transgender, father of two, a filmmaker, an educator. Um, I, I work at Charles of Hobbes, a school bait safer for Bill Spencer. And um, I'm a writer of Trans Inspired Liturgy. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Welcome to the TGNC committee at Charles Hobbes. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, we wanted to create a space for members who are trans or gender nonconforming or non-binary or gender fluid or intersex or questioning, and we wanted to be able to get them to connect. Uh, so uh, it can, it can, it's like a place where we share ideas and information, uh, we celebrate, we vent, um, and we plan an event or two every once in a while, um, a service maybe here or there. Um, it's really up to the group of what it is and what it becomes. Um, in honor of Transgender Day of Visibility, uh, you know, thank you for joining us tonight, this evening for a panel discussion about the pro power of pro-trans legislation. Franco, would you like to do a little bit of, um, A little bit of uh, housekeeping before you start. Yes, uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, welcome, everybody, here, uh, to this wonderful little event. Uh, thank you, Rabbi, for that wonderful chanting service. And if, please, I really recommend that you attend the monthly ones. They are absolutely wonderful. And thank you, Marty, for your presentation on pronouns. For those who might have not had the pleasure to meet, my name is Franco Martinez. My pronouns are they, them, and I am here as a member of Charles Akhav, as well as an officer at large uh, for the World Congress of LGBT Jewish Organizations. And it is my absolute pleasure and honor to moderate this panel for y'all. Uh, I hope to have a vibrant discussion here with our panelists. And there will be a link that we will post in the chat to a Google form we can submit. Uh, any questions that you may have, and I will receive them on my little device. Oh, it's just like, it's just like I dreamed that when I was a child, I have a little device to communicate with everybody else. Uh, as Marty said, uh, in the past year, we have seen a dramatic rise in anti-LGBTQ and especially anti-trans legislation pushing its way through various states. Uh, the HRC points out that out of 340 anti-LGBT bills, 150 the, 50 of those are geared against our trans siblings. I really hope our conversation tonight can help us understand where we are and uh, where we could go. And just as a matter of uh, housekeeping, unfortunately, Cecilia Chung was feeling ill today and uh, could not make it. And I believe that we are still uh, waiting on S Senator Scott Weiner. So for now, I will go ahead and invite up uh, Rabbi Eliana Kayel, uh, pronouns they, them. Uh, they are the Bay Area Education and Training Manager for Keshet, uh, which is an organization that works for the full equality of all LGBTQ Jews and our families in Jewish life. Eliana received uh, rabbinical origination is part of the first cohort of pluralistic of the pluralistic rabbinical seminary. In spring 2002, they launched "You Gotta Give Them Torah," which offers adult education focused on identity, sexuality, and spirituality. And the work has been published by Lith and Hayama. Welcome. Hi, I'm so excited to be here and be in this space and be in this conversation with all of you. I'd also like to call up Rabbi Ribbon Zelman, uh, who is a graduate of Hebrew Union College, uh, Jewish Institute of Religion, and has been a transgender activist since 99. Uh, he has written many articles and educational materials about gender, sexuality, and Judaism, and has taught at congregations, conferences, and universities around the U.S. Uh, they currently serve as the assistant rabbi and music director at Congregation Bethel in Berkeley, California. 
Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to see you. That last thing was totally true for nine years, but it just isn't anymore. But all the other things were absolutely accurate, and I'm delighted to see all of you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be part of this conversation. Okay, I'm going to post the link in the chat right now, so that way y'all can start uh, submitting any questions that you have. Right, I'm going to change my view so I can uh, see y'all. Hello. I hope y'all's day has been well. It's been very rainy here in San Francisco. Let's see. Right. So I, I guess a good place to start is how did we get here, like to this point? Because we weren't seeing this much outward, like mobilization to legislate trans lives. Um, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> um, I think that there is, um, I, I think a lot has to do with power and control when you can legislate people's bodies, which we're seeing in a number of different ways. Um, you know, then it only enhances the this idea of what power can look like and what power is, especially for those who hold uh, identities with a lot of privilege. Um, I think there's also a real banking on uh, misinformation and people not taking it upon themselves to to educate uh, to educate themselves and educate their communities and really relying on this misinformation that can spread so quickly, um, especially in 2023 and social media and the internet and all of that. Um, gosh, I mean, I think obviously there is a big backlash here, right? I mean, 20 years ago when we were starting this work, there was no backlash because nobody cared, right? Or 30 years ago, and you know, I think everyone in this Zoom can think about a, a parallel situation where um, in, in your own work, in your own lives, where um, there was, you know, a point, whatever, 25 or 30 years ago, when um, talking about these kinds of things that so, all the words and all these amazing things that we just talked about um, were so far out, they were so just so fringe and so far beyond what anybody was even willing to entertain as serious um, that, you know, nobody, I mean, you know, people simply, and, and I really mean this very literally, thought that we were all very mentally ill. And so nobody, and, and treated us as such much of the time, um, and there are many issues with that, including the demonization and non-normalization of all kinds of mental struggles that many of us go through. Um, but it was a way of not having to engage in anything that was being said or done. And of course, now they can't do that anymore, um, mostly because the young people are not going to have it. Um, and the things that, you know, were used to try to suppress what my generation was doing are no longer possible. And so they have to try new things. Um, there are many, I'll use the word sins being committed by the folks who are doing this. One of them, of course, being going after children of all for things over which that just shouldn't happen. And of course, the second is this incredible misappropriation of public time, public resource that these folks are given the privilege through their election of deciding what to do with that public time and that public resource and trust. And they, we can all think of so many desperately needed things that need to be done. And instead they're doing this. Um, and I think there are many reasons why that is beneficial to different folks. And nothing that everyone here doesn't already know, but those are some initial reflections. And I see that some of our panelists, uh, other panelists are here. Yay. Yay. Hey. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Senator Scott, uh, I I don't think you need an introduction, but I will once again attempt mildly. Uh, Senator Scott Wiener represents San Francisco and Northern San Mateo County and uh, the California State Senate. Elected in 2016, uh, Senator Wiener focuses extensively on housing, transportation, civil rights, criminal justice reform, clean energy, alleviating poverty. Uh, he chairs the Senate Housing Committee and is co-chair of the California Legislative Jewish Caucus. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you. The, yes. 
So the first question that we uh, were sort of ruminating on is how uh, how did we get to uh, this level of just concerted legislative effort? Because if I if I remember correctly, in 2016, when Governor uh, Pat McCrory in North Carolina tried to pass uh, their uh, anti-trans bathroom bill, they were met with a severe backlash. And everything, I, th I think we've been kind of talking about how everything we see now is almost a backlash to that, which just appears to be even stronger and more mobilized. Well, I think that the um, the sort of MAGA right-wing, you know, sort of proto-fascist, whatever we want to call it, world, uh, they've gotten a lot more organized um, in the last five, six uh, years, and they're very good at mobilizing their messaging on social media and on their uh, the media outlets that they control, and it's all very, very orchestrated. And I see it, you know, on my on my um, Twitter feed, which I is painful to even read anymore because there's so many of them, and they but it's all the same kind of things, and they're all um, focused on the same, uh, you know, the 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 sort of the sort of woke. Um, uh, quote unquote uh, example of the day and things that they're focused on. It's very much at the mothership. Uh, it's they're, it's it, it's like a brainwashed zombie apocalypse army, um, and they're just sort of fed something every day, and that's what they focus on. And so now they 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 think that they, I think you were saying this. What, someone was saying this when I got on on sort of traditional, you know gay and lesbian you know marriage what basic you know stuff that they, they 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 hate us still and they still say things like groomer so they're still you know they're still hostile to us but they know that that's not you know they're not going to win on that and they think that because people know a lot less about trans people um that and because there's a um, in some circles you know people might be uncomfortable particularly around, you know, with kids, um, they, they're exploiting uh, that potential wedge with more uh, middle of the road voters or middle of the road people um, who, aren't who aren't hostile, but can be sort of manipulated and think, oh, they're coming for your kid. They're gonna like amputate your child, um, which is what they will say. And so I, I, I think it's for us, it, it's just so important for us to stick together to really keep our allies with us and to hold our allies accountable. And I think that that is happening. Um, and to be, you know, push out our own proactive message. So people aren't just hearing these horrible uh, things. They're trying to really pathologize trans people. Um, and, and, and what happened on Monday, of course, they're, they're, they're pouring light, lighter fluid on that. We don't even know very much about this person. We've heard like snippets. Um, we're already, you know, they're just jumping to, you know, right off the, off the end. Um, we're trying to, you know, say that all trans people are dangerous and and violent, and and and, ho and hormones make you um, violent, which I mean, of course, isn't true. And if what if if that were true, then then like when they were saying like, if you're on hormones, you shouldn't be able to get a gun. That would mean all men shouldn't be able to get. I have testosterone in my system too. So, you know, it's, but it's just like, uh, like just absurd what they're saying, but they are, you know, it's like over and over again. And, and if it's not rebutted, then eventually subliminally it starts sinking in uh, with people. And that's why it's so incredibly dangerous. What has been y'all's uh, reaction to these Bills and the overall sentiment, because I'll share for myself that when I, I I did start seeing like an uptick in a lot of this rhetoric, my my mind immediately went to okay, well let me almost double down and see what ways I can do to help make myself visible to say that I am I'm here, I am trans and I'm Jewish, and see what we can do. I mean, I, th I think that's great. I mean, everyone has to make a personal decision. When you put yourself out there, you become a target. I mean, I, I you know, I get targeted like crazy, um, but you know, I, I can, I also have, have a platform. And so I feel responsibility to, to be very vocal. And I, if you're in elected office, like that, 
that's what you do. You, you're visible and, and vocal about issues, but for a lot of people, they're really, um, it's a personal choice because there are people who don't want to put themselves in that spotlight or put their families uh, in that spotlight. But I think for, if you're, for people who are willing to do that, that that's incredibly powerful incredibly powerful i don't know if you saw I, I i put it on twitter it came out i think this morning there um because florida is considering a law to you know to to ban bathroom access uh for trans people to require people to use their the bathroom of their birth assigned gender and there was a, a witness who was like a senior at, at florida state or university of florida who who is a um a trans man who if in like is able to like no one would ever know um that that uh that he was trans they would just assume he was cis and so he testified he said you're forcing me he said people he said i i have the privilege of people assuming i'm cis and being able to quote unquote pass um and he said you're going to force me to use a women's restroom and so me with my big beard um and, and you know i'm going to be with your wife and your daughter and, and a women's restroom and how do you feel about that it was a really powerful testimony i put the video on my on my twitter feed because what they're doing it's just so stupid because gen gender and and trans community and gender it, it's this massive spectrum right it's not even like there's like trans women and trans men and everyone can get put in this like convenient like you know category it's like this unbelievably diverse spectrum that you, you try to legislate around some of these gender issues, even, even if, if, even if it were a good idea, which it's not, it's a terrible idea. It's horrible. But even if it were a good idea, I don't even know how you really do it effectively. I wanna, yeah. I wanna, I wanna ask Liana, like how does, has, how does, how does Keshet um, deal with it? Has Keshet faced like a lot of backlash? Um, so depending on like the situation and where we are, I mean, our community mobilization department, um, which is led by John Cohen and the community mobilization manager, Lainey Cohen, not related, um, but they were both uh, in Texas um, lobbying and showing up and, you know, there, there you'll find um, some backlash and pushback. And that's also where a lot of the legislation is going through. Um, and then also, I mean, depending on the training and where we are, I mean, there's been times even here in the Bay, you know, someone says, hey, I have a question. And then they actually take the opportunity to say something that's actually a little bit harmful. Um, and that happens also. So sometimes it's more covert and sometimes it's the, it's the, the covert versus overt um, harm and rhetoric um, that is shared. And, you know, it's okay not to know things. We don't know things until we know things. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is definitely, there is definitely pushback that happens. And it's just a matter of how, where, and why, I think. How about yourself, Ruben? Oh, that unmute button. I got it. Um, we're responding to the question of sort of just how are we individually reacting to all of this? Uh, yeah. I mean, aside from just being sad and outraged, as I think many of us are on, on many different levels, um, it certainly does make you think like what, especially those of us who are lucky enough to live in California, what should we do? And that is off. That's something that I roll around in my head a lot. Um, um, aside from, uh, you know, continuing to live here and to support the, the things that are going the right way in the place where we do live, which is not nothing, um, and is the direct result of what many people here on this call have been doing for a long time. Um, and so that's one thing. Um, you know, it's really interesting because the ways that we can be present for people in other places that were not a thing when, you know, when I first came out in the 90s um, and the revelation of the internet and people being able to send anonymous messages to me being like, hey, I'm a closeted trans person in a yeshiva and nobody knows anything about me and they never will, but I wanted to tell somebody I was here. I mean, that is a miracle, right? That we have the option to be present for people who are going through this completely not where we are. 
Um, and that is something that I, is something that I've definitely been thinking about. Like, how can we use that tool to be really showing up maximally for those folks? The other piece is um, that I think about is, all right, what is the what is the low hanging fruit? Where is the place that is going to be kind of uncomfortable to push into, but could work, right? Where where the, where work could be done. Um, where there are folks who who want to be inclusive, want to understand, want to make that effort, and need some support and some expertise and some guidance to do it. There are lots of places like that, um, and um, and of course there are also places where that have no interest in becoming that, and that's a, a separate that's a separate issue, right? Um, but I feel like there are a really large and growing number of synagogues, churches, community centers, schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all over the country, even in these states where all of these terrible things are currently happening, that know they're wrong and they want, they could use some of our support to help channel that outrage in the right direction um, and help them really, you know, I've spent a lot of time with folks who really wanted to be welcoming, want to be positive, want to be inclusive. They, they just didn't yet have the ability to envision what they would have to do in order to do it. Um, and so those are the folks I think about who are going through these things, who, um, who I feel like, you know, we can stretch ourselves as far as possible to be present for them. That's just some kind of initial thoughts. I was thinking as well about how how does uh, how does this affect uh, California? And I, I know that California was made a sanctuary state for those seeking uh, gender affirming care. Uh, but I, I I think I worry, and I think the legislature worries, and uh, Kesha definitely worries about how that will affect these young folk who then have to go back to the states in which they live. Well, when we passed that law, SB 107, um, first of all, it, it's not just uh, about coming here to get gender affirming care. It's also families that want to relocate because they don't feel safe in their state um, because the parents are being threatened with criminal prosecution. They're having they're, the state's threatening to remove the child and put them in, in foster care and so forth, that they can come to California and unless we are absolutely compelled by the US Constitution. We're not going to honor an extradition warrant. We're not going to honor subpoenas. Uh, we're just not going to uh, cooperate. Um, I see there's a, something about uh, a message in the chat about, is there assistance for them? The answer is, as of now, no, not from the state. Um, we want to, you know, when we did SB 107, I, I would never pretend that that like fixed the entire problem what we wanted is to at least create the legal structure so that people if they felt they needed to come here they could come here and feel safe and that we were going to do everything in our power to keep them uh safe uh we, we also housing is too expensive here um it's you know not just in san francisco but up and down the state and we're, we're working on that around housing and that's another big gnarly tough issue um but it, it, it you know there, there it would be I, i'm i'm not totally familiar with all the mutual aid happening. Um, there, like for example, around abortion access, there, there are foundations and funds that that help pay for people to, to get around and get the care that they need. I don't know actually what's out there in terms of uh, the LGBTQ community. So I, th I think the central question of this panel for all of us to, and this, this question would be for all of us, is how does pro-LGBTQ legislation help us fight? Do you mean, do you mean at the state level or at the federal state, level? At the state level, at the federal level? Oh, oh, sure. Well, I mean, at the federal level, it's the best because it's like the whole country uh, and, the, and Congress have, would have quite enormous power, although the Supreme Court has gone off the deep end um, to protect uh, civil rights. Um, uh, at the state level, when we've done a number of things to make life better for trans people, you know, last, last year I authored a new law 
SB 923, requiring better cultural competency among healthcare providers and insurance companies in interacting with and treating trans people, and also making requiring insurance companies to have uh, a section of their network directory uh, for um, sort of gender inclusive and uh, um, providers and providers that provide that that treat trans people, provide gender affirming care, uh, and so forth. Because one thing that I've heard from a number of trans people is that you have to just start calling around offices. You don't even know. And so we were, we're requiring insurance companies to make that a lot easier. Um, you know, we passed um, a law around um, driver's licenses and other government documents so that people could identify um, with, uh, if they're non-binary, uh, they don't have to, you know, they, they don't have to lie about uh, what their uh, what their gender is. We have, um, uh, we've been, um, we created a health and wellness fund focusing on the trans community. Uh, we put some funding into it, not enough, and we're in a bad budget year, but we at least created the structure and put some initial funding in it uh, so that we are um, supporting the health and well-being um, of trans people. We repealed some terrible uh, criminal laws that targeted uh, trans people disproportionately. Um, uh, and so I think we're, we're going to, and there's more work happening uh, uh, this year. Um, but it would be it sure would be great if Congress could get it together to pass some truly broad civil rights protections for that for all LGBTQ uh, people, because that could wipe away some of these state laws potentially. And I saw that Martin posted um, a very bad lie a few three or four weeks ago. I was commenting to uh, someone, to one of my colleagues, say, "Okay, I we have some really conservative Republicans in the legislature, but at least they don't." Uh, at least they don't introduce anti-LGBTQ bills. And like two days later, a Republican assembly member introduced AB 1314 to mandate the teachers uh, out uh, uh, trans or gender questioning uh, uh, kids to their parents, even if the kids aren't ready or even if it's unsafe. Horrible bill that will die a quick death, but it's just terrible. Uh, oh, sorry, Ruben, go for it if you were gonna. Oh, I, I was just, it's striking me as I'm listening, you know, all of the, the talk list, the, de the legislative details of how these things work on the political level leave to the senator, but for sure, I mean, it is remarkable to me, you know, listening to, as you speak, like this, there's so much fear in all of this, right? There's this, there is a fear that the teachers are conspiring with people's children to hide things from their parents, right? So like all this stuff that, um, you know, if you think about, oh my gosh, like what if God forbid such a bill passed, right? Completely unmanageable, could not possibly, like just there, the issues are so many that we could all come up with a hundred right now um, as to why that would be a disaster. Um, but the, the, there's just, I, you know, it's hard for me not to sometimes just see this as fear of people just feel like kind of what they expected for how the world is supposed to work is being somehow kind of stolen from them, right? And they're angry, like, and I know a lot of folks like this, you know, who sort of felt like they were entitled to have cisgender children. I don't know how else to put it, right? I think some of you are not, and you know what I mean. Right, that they were enti or entitled to have heterosexual children or whatever. Well, I'm sorry, but you're not. <laughs> you gets what you gets, um, and so the fear that of, that people are having that there is sort of this widespread conspiracy of schools and liberal faith institutions that we're all conspiring to mess with your kids behind your back, right? Um, it is kind of, when I think about it kind of through a spiritual lens, it's really a remarkable phenomenon. Um, that's the nicest way I can put it. Um, but um, I mean, it's it's sad because right there is so much terror there. Um, but also we've all seen this before, right? Like all you queer people on this call have seen this very same thing before in a hundred different formats, right? Oh no, the teachers are gay and they're gonna turn all the kids gay. Oh no, this, that, right? We could go back 40 years and think of all of the things. I think the thing that's hard for me 
personally, and I'll say that what's hard for me personally is the, on the one hand, the blessing is that I know that two generations from now, this bullshit is going to not, they can't do it anymore. Right. Because the people who are now 20, 15, 25 years old will not have it. It will not be possible um, in the way it is now um, because young people don't think the way that we were raised. They don't think that way anymore. Thank God. Right. They have gotten out of that Egypt. They have, they have gotten out of it. Not all of them. And we need to help all the rest of them, but like things are really changing with younger folks and how they think about these things. They don't have these fears the same ways that like the kind of fears that we're seeing publicly enacted now. Um, and so the positive is that in a couple of generations, right, this is going to be so different. The fury that I had is, like, you know what, do it now, do it now. Don't sacrifice any more generations to this. Just skip the part where we, you know, have to try to, you know, push this movement back into the box as we've tried to do with every other movement for good things, right? Try to like, surely there's a way to squash this. Thank God there isn't. Um, but it is hard for me to watch the suffering that is going on in the meantime, you know, that is totally avoidable. Um, that part's really hard. Um, if I could just add something to that, um, because and it's even circling back a little bit to one of the earlier questions, um, which is like kind of how I'm I'm receiving this and kind of dealing with all of it. One of the most heartbreaking pieces to this is seeing the videos on social media going around of children testifying, um, trans and non-binary youth that are having to literally face the courts by themselves. And on the one hand, how incredibly brave that the kind of courage that that takes. And also they shouldn't have to be doing this, right? Like, you know, children should be children and teens should be teens and they shouldn't have to go into court and have to testify on their humanity. Um, it's so outrageous. And one of the things that kind of keeps me grounded in this and what Rabbi Zalman was just sharing, I mean, what really kind of like because I get filled with a lot of righteous rage, as I'm sure many of us on this call do, um, is kind of the, the grounding of the journey of the movement. The fact that I get to be on this call with Rabbi Zalman, someone who I've admired, who paved the way for me to be here. I mean, I think this is a miracle, right? That like we get to be here and now I get to be speaking in this moment. I think that that's a really wild concept and that's only going to keep happening. And so the fact that there are these children testifying, they are taking the mic and they are doing that, that's it. And um, it's heartbreaking and empowering all at once. I think there's definite like duality about it, but it is just, it's mind boggling for sure. Uh, on that's the same thought, actually. I was going to ask about Thrive. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Keshet launched its Thrive project uh, last year as a Jewish coalition to defend trans and LGBTQ youth. And some of their work has been in educating organizations about what laws are being passed and where. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about Keshet and Thrive? Sure. So the Thrive Coalition is spearheaded by Keshet's Community Mobilization Department um, in partnership with Sojourn, which is the Southern Jewish Resource Network for Gender and Sexual Diversity. I was reading it. I wanted to make sure I got it right. Um, and it is now about 200 Jewish organizations nationwide that have come together and saying, you know, we're not here for any of this anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. And it's taking action. And some, some of the meetings, there's monthly meetings. Um, Sha'ar Zahav is part of the coalition. And sometimes there's action items attached, but it's also a lot of education. Like I was saying, you don't know things until you know things. So we have to actually know what is going on around the country. And uh, here in California, for anyone um, that is here, like what is the legislation we were just talking about um, and what steps we can take. So a lot of the education is learning from the people who are most impacted. That's the most important thing, actually learning from trans and non-binary people, um, especially if you are not as familiar with the trans experience. 
um, and also making sure that then any information that is being brought back from the representatives of the organizations that are part of the coalition actually attending the meetings, we want to make sure it's accurate information that then they are bringing back. So that's another purpose. Um, and then kind of what we can do as communities, as synagogues, JCCs, day schools, um, any other social justice uh, organizations that are part of it, um, learning about it, taking that direct action in this kind of bigger movement. Uh, I saw somebody in the chat um, saying that they lived e for years in Oklahoma and Tennessee and wondered if they'd be, ever be able to go back. And I, I, I feel that I have family in Tennessee that I visit yearly and every year it just feels like it's getting a little bit harder to be able to make the trip. Um, what what sh should be the Jewish response to this? Like, what is it and what do we think it should be? So I, um, I suppose one of the things I can, I, I'd like to share is I have worked for the last year on the on Zvara's Transalacha project, well, which has been absolutely eye-opening to me in terms of hope. Because for, for now, now we have uh, trans prayers and blessings that we can share with the world and teshuvas that we've written, uh, one of which was on uh, trans nida, for those of you who have and don't know what Nida is, Nida is the laws around uh, uh, menstrual cycles and immersing in the mikvah. And there, there hadn't been any papers or Jewish thoughts on this, and suddenly there are. And I, <laughs> Rabbi Zelman, I don't mean to push you on the spot, but trans Torah. I sort of agreed to be on the spot when I said I would be on the panel, so that's fair. <laughs> Can you restate your question again? I think I lost part of it. Uh, I, I, what what is and what like, what should be the Jewish response to this? I mean, there's never going to be just one. Of course, all the Jews are going to respond just the way that we think is fit, and I think that that's good, right? So, like, I'm looking at the faces today of lots of people who have been doing, you know, who have been working in social work around this for in mental health for many years, and other people who have been. Um, lawyering for many years to try to make these things right. And other people who have been doing all kinds of art and all, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so that's a given um, that, you know, I'm proud that we have so many Jewish people who are fighting on the front lines of these, you know, I think we can all be proud of that. Um, you know, I think there's there's the two pieces. There's the things that we have to oppose, and then there's the things that we have to build to make sure that, you know, as when people are looking for, well, what's the alternative to all this fear-based living, that they find something, and and we want them to find something wherever they are. Um, and you know, I'm have um, been a. I'll say a, a fan and a member and um, a, um, I have a great fondness for Congregation Shara Zahav, largely because I think that that is what has been trying to be done in, the, you know, by a whole lot of people for a whole lot of years to say what, but what's the alternative, right? Like, if we actually build the alternative, what's that going to be? What does that require of us? Um, and, um, and, and a lot of different places are doing this. Um, you know, including places that I might not think, you know, so synagogue and Jewish communities where um, that are not necessarily out in the front of, of this movement like Shar Zahab, but are, but are asking real questions about, you know, what do we have to do um, to, you know, to, uh, to build the, the kind of Jewish space that genuinely supports people. And there are so many interlinked issues here, obviously, right? you know, when we talk about trans inclusion broadly, we have to talk about, you know, income inequality and how that impacts people's participation in all kinds of things, including the Jewish community, right? That's a major issue. Um, we have to talk about healthcare disparities, which 
Of course, oi, we won't even go there. Thank you, United States. Um, but um, but those intersect with trans experiences in some really specific ways that, um, and so there are all these ways I think that as you know, as we're building for trans inclusion and, and just we're really building for inclusion in general. Um, and, um, you know, as soon as we can start to welcome, you know, when, as we started to welcome trans people, we've really, we've been starting to welcome a lot of other people more successfully as well. Um, as we sort of slowly start to decenter, like who we think is going to come in the door of the Jewish community center or of the synagogue, what do we think they're going to look like or sound like or need from us, right? All of that stuff. Um, so I think that that's the part that that excites me is where the places where we really are building like alternative universes. I direct um, an all transgender chorus here in San Francisco called New Voices Bay Area. Um, and the purpose of that was to create basically an alternate universe of what it could mean to be in a chorus. Like not right, we have to get rid of all of the negative gender things where people are forced to wear outfits. You know, if you want to sing, you have to wear outfits that you don't feel comfortable in, or you have to sing music that does not express anything that you believe or so on and so forth. So we have to get rid of all of those things. We have to, but then also, okay, so now what, right? What are the things that we want to build here and learn from these communities that, that can, you know, we, it's, it's as I think about these kind of legislation, right? It's not like they have trans people participating in writing this, right? There's a reason why all of these bills are so detached from reality, right? They don't typically have trans folks who they're actually listening and saying, so what is your experience with the public restrooms, right? That's not happening. And you can tell because then you end up with these legislation that doesn't even make any sense. Um, but we can ask people those questions, right? Our Jewish communities can ask people those questions and listen to the answers and build from them. Um, oh, go for it. I saw you just unmute. Um, Kesha just released, um, we have our seven Jewish values to kind of like our pillars, but we just released our seven Jewish values of action. And I think my favorite one, and I think the one that it really... I think can just kind of is all encompassing is the lo ta'amod al dam echa, which is to not stand idly by. And I think both for trans and non-binary community, um, one, like, yes, let's create these spaces and create these, these worlds and the, the areas of belonging. And also super important for the Jewish response for our allies um, for trans and non-binary community. And we all have an obligation to act and you know my interpretation of what this means we all have an obligation to act if anyone is in harm's way or their safety their well-being is under attack you know we have to do something so i think it's kind of uh, it's holding both we want to what is the jewish jewish response within community and then also what is the jewish response for all of our allies that are hoping to rise with us yeah i, I think um I'm not a rabbi, so I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, not, I'm, I'm looking at this, I don't know, more uh, um, just, um, I guess, politically than, than anything. I, I think the Jewish community has an incredibly powerful voice to, to bring uh, to bear here. Um, and, you know, this, if you look, you know, Jews are like, we're such a tiny, tiny percentage of the population but we speak with a certain moral authority um, because of our history in some ways, community that's been expelled and had genocide committed against us and has had rights stripped away and been told that we're responsible for killing children. Sound familiar, right? That we're a threat to children. That's always been something that's been said about Jews going back to the you know, middle ages um, that you know, we're uh, responsible for disease that, that sound, also sound familiar like we, i mean so so many of the attacks on lgbtq people have been made on jews as at some point or another um and, and you look at there there's been some stuff i've seen online recently just looking at some um newspaper clippings from the 1930s and what what was being done to jews and said about jews and, and tragically some of it's very similar to what's being said today and so i, I think um 
when Jews speak, especially non-LGBTQ Jews, um, I think that's, I mean, it's powerful when we speak up, don't get me wrong, but, but when, when the broader Jewish community speaks up, this is, you know, sort of pronounces, this is heading towards a very bad place. And, and, and that, that's super powerful. And I know some, like the ADL, and there have been some big mainline Jewish groups that have been very vocal about these issues. And I think it's super powerful. And I think Jews have an absolute responsibility to stick up uh, for, for queer people. That actually brings me up to my next question. So I was gonna ask how, uh, how can individuals help? How can we give people the resources or how can people find resources of who can they call um, events that they can go to or things like even Charles Hop can help sponsor? Well, I, I mean, if I could just, I, I think all of these states that are under attack, they, they generally have, they have many of them organizations um, that, that fight for LGBTQ people. They're probably underfunded, um, right? We're lucky in California with Quality California, which is a well-funded, well-developed organization that fights statewide and other organizations as well. Um, a lot of these states probably have smaller organizations and they may or may not be well-equipped to fight some of these huge political fights. Um, and I think anything we can do to uh, support those organizations financially um, or with pro bono legal assistance um, would be powerful. And I don't, I'm not sure if, anyone, if anyone's compiled a list of some of those um, organizations, but that strikes me. And that strikes me as a very impactful investment because with organizations that have small budgets it doesn't take a lot of money to really help elevate them and give them the resources uh, that they need. Um, there's an organization called the Transformations Project, which has a database that tracks all of the anti-trans and non-binary legislation um, and the movement of it. And also in this database is who to contact within the different states. Um, so that's just, I think, a great organization to, to know about um, and to see kind of uh, where you can take action there. And then also education is such a, a huge thing, the, the learning piece of it, and then knowing how to have those conversations with your family, with your communities, at your places of work, um, knowing how to intervene if you feel it's safe to intervene. Um, those are all huge things that might feel like it's tiny action, but it's always better to do something than nothing. And also, even if it feels tiny, it's actually not. That's how change happens. That's how we move the needle. So also wanting to encourage these, these actions like in our in our day-to-day -day life and um, just kind of how we move through the world. I'm gonna read uh, one other question. Oh, oh, I, I know it's super painful. And a lot of people don't want to do it. And you wouldn't want to get have your whole life get caught up in this because it's not good for anyone's mental health. Fighting on social media, I, I actually think has some value. Um, and when there are people who are willing to like go on and push back and respond to some of this, it, 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 it actually does, it, it does have an impact and it does matter. Um, it's not for everyone. And again, I'm not suggesting you get sucked into this massive wormhole, uh, but for people who have the kind of personality where they sort of maybe do well in that kind of environment, it actually does matter. Um, that, <laughs> that actually links to this question here. I was, I'm gonna read uh, a question that was submitted on the Google form. And for everybody in the chat, um, I, I, the chat kind of goes by quickly. So if you want to just submit them on the link, I can go ahead and read them. Uh, so, oh, this Saturday, um, we had some people yell at some of our students and, uh, and the questions were really sexualized and about uh, genitalia. And this person asks, how do we respond to these attacks on our kids?
not sure what they meant by the people yelled at um, students. Oh, sorry. At the Saturday, um, somebody yelled at uh, the, some of the students from Shars from our school at Sharzahov. Or some we they attended a rally, and there was oh. somebody there who. Oh was, yeah, there was a guy who a disruptor. Okay, so I I have some opinions um, about it because I I I I was not there, but I saw the video that he posted, which got millions and millions of views. Um, and he's just like a total. Can I can I use a curse word? With is that like a piece of you know what? Okay, I'll, I'll be polite about it. Piece of you know what? Um, and he, you know, provocateur. You know, trying and he he. I think in those kind of situations, honestly, it's best to ignore them um, because they want attention. They're, they're trying to like get good video. And, and he got a bunch of people who definitely reacted. I'm not criticizing anyone for reacting, right? This is people's lives. And he's like literally tr trying to like um, demonize people and say that their life has no value. So I totally, people should be pissed off about that. Um, but in this, social media online world that we're in you know he wanted he wanted them to throw coffee i think someone threw coffee on him people were yelling giving him the finger and all that um which made all of us probably feel good <laughs> um to to see you know with that anger which is totally justified but that's exactly what he wanted and so i find that with this people who are doing that just to ignore them and you take the oxygen um away away from them but again, it's easier said than done, right? Because it is very, it just makes us all so angry that someone would do something like that. And it's hard, especially for young people to, to ignore that, it's hard. Um, may I just toss in a thought here? I mean, I found myself in many of these situations and you know, in different formats over time. Um, and there's a couple of comments that are coming up in the chat that are similar to this, right? Where, you know, I think there is the piece where we affirm, this is actually what our values are, which is we don't speak about people like that here. You know, actually we don't treat children the way that you're treating them and it's unacceptable. So we're leaving, goodbye, right? Like the, so there's the ignoring of them, maybe it's, it's all so complicated and nobody knows the right answer for a lot of these things, I think. But I do think it's really important, especially when we're dealing with kids. We don't always know what they've taken away from a situation. It can be really hard to tell. Um, and, you know, it depends on their age and so many other things. And that's part of what makes this all, you know, all the more layers of complication around this. But I do think that um, whatever our response is to the persecutors, I think it's critically important that we always state who we are. What is it that we believe? How do we treat people here? Um, to make sure that that is never not said. Uh, somebody else asks, how can we scale up best practices across California in terms of professional development, gender diversity for teachers, um, access to all gender restrooms in schools, community centers? Well, we're, we're going to hopefully be mandating that schools have, uh, have all gender bathrooms this year. That's a bill that my colleague, uh, Senator Josh Newman from Orange County uh, introduced, straight ally, <laughs> Jewish. The Jewish straight alley, um, uh, and that, that that's a that's a good one. So that one, hopefully, we will uh, resolve that uh, this year. Uh, Rabbi Elena, are there anything? Is there anything like that we, uh, as a Jewish organization, Charles House specifically, can do around this? Like apart from having these sorts of panels? Yeah, I mean. The first thing I would say is join Thrive, which you're already doing. Shara Zahav is already a member, and I saw Rabbi Copeland shared that there's four, I think, members that show up, which is awesome. Um, and still just the education piece. I mean, this is evolving so quickly and moving so fast every day. And um, so I think really just staying up to date and educated and having these 
panels, having the discussions, having the trainings. I also just shared, um, I, I private messaged, um, we have a resource that's uh, trans misconceptions and how to have the hard conversations, especially if you are not in the trans and non-binary community. Um, but when people come with maybe uh, not with uh, malicious intent, but asking questions about trans people, and it has kind of the answers and all of the information in a factual way. And um, I think kind of having having those answers in your back pocket, which not Jewish organization specific, but just kind of in general for, for people to know and to have, um, I think is super helpful. Oh, could you share that in the chat again? Yes. Um, no, I want to be a little bit mindful on time. So two people asked a very similar question, and I think it's a good last question for us all. Uh, wondering if there are signs of hope in all of this. It's hard not to be very discouraged and disheartened by all the hate being spewed. Uh, what, what, gives, what gives all of you hope in these times? You know, one of the things that gives me, and this is an, an extreme example of the hope, uh, is, is that what's happening in Iran uh, right now, that you have all of these young people, or not just young, but people, and particularly women, particularly young women and older women, who are literally risking their lives against this like totally violent fascist regime. Uh, and they're doing it, they're just, they're done. They're done with the way that women are treated uh, and queer people uh, in, in that country. And, and, it, and it's very inspiring. To me. They just keep going and keep going, risking their lives. And I see that in, in, on this issue, which we're, is a, a lower level because it's not the same extreme brutality at the moment. It is at times, but um, we, we don't have you know, the government doing what they're doing there. It could get there. Um, and uh, when I see young people here in particular, and people who are super like marginalized and beaten down, just keeping going in these states, right? Not in San Francisco, but in Mississippi, right? And in, 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 in Oklahoma and places where it can be physically unsafe to, to do this advocacy and to show up and testify at legislative hearings when you have these just like Neanderthal, you know, uh, you know, right wingers, Republicans that are just the things that they're saying and the hate coming out of their mouth and the incitement to violence. And these these people and particularly young people just keep going. And that, that really inspires me. Um, yeah, I think big same. <laughs> it's it's seeing um, all of the all of the young people, younger people, um, really just fighting back and pushing back in just really extraordinary ways. Um, and also the smaller moments. One of my favorite stories to share is um, I'm a I'm a recent East Coast transplant to the Bay. Um, so where I was working in New York the last few years, uh, one of the first days that I was teaching a sixth grade class said, hi, I'm Eliana, my pronouns are they, them. And a few students misgendered me. And it was one of the other students who actually intervened um, and then even corrected another teacher saying, no, Eliana uses they, them pronouns. They're non-binary and kind of doing the education for me. And I just thought that was the most incredible thing. And it was a, probably just like a nothing small act to them. Like, of course they were gonna do this, um, but it just, it meant so much to me. And truly the moments like that keep me going tenfold. Agreed, agreed. I mean, it is truly remarkable, you know, as a trans person who was born in seven, 1978, I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling. And I'm not right. I'm only 44 to be clear. Right. But my mind is still like, I can't get over how much change there in fact has been um, really fast. Um, and it's not enough. And now we're experiencing a horrible backlash and, you know, it's absolute right. Could there be more backlashes? Yes. Could there be more things coming at us from issues we thought that we had resolved? Yeah, that it could be, but 
I don't think it can ever be like it was when I was a kid. I mean, trans people are out of the bag, folks. You're not putting us back in. You know, everybody knows about us now. (laughs) And the folks who need to, they will. They will. It will get there. We will get it to them. Um, And so on the one hand, like, this is such an ugly moment. And, you know, and we need, I mean, there was a couple of comments, right? Like, we need to be prepared to say, like, this is immoral, right? As as progressive religious people, this is immoral behavior. Um, and and use that kind of language to speak up for ourselves and for our values. Um, and, and at the same time, it is just extraordinary, the cultural creativity that is just exploding in the trans community. You know, as soon as we got a little bit of light, out we went. Um, and, you know, I guess the backlash is not surprising. Um, but we're not going away. That's never going to happen again. Um, and especially our young folks. But, you know, trans people of all ages are, you know, are able to do things now that we could not have dreamed of before. Um, and so even with all this ugliness, there is so much really glorious change that that is still happening right at the same time. So that keeps me going. Thank you all so, so much. Y'all give me hope. Um, I, I, I know it's hard on Zoom, but I just want to clap all of you up for coming here tonight and having this brilliant conversation with me. Uh, may you all live to be 120. Thank you so, so much for coming. And thank everybody for attending. Uh, thank this has been- Thank so you so much for inviting us. Thank you.